of God will bring life to the world. They bring healing. They bring hope. They bring all of that. Without the teachings of God, we have nothing. God of restoration.
month in which <laughs> in which the covenant is made the covenant is made and it is a marriage covenant God made a marriage covenant when he brought the Torah to Moses on Mount Sinai he said you will be my wife Israel you will be my people and I will make you into a nation of kingdom a kingdom a nation of priests and of kings When Yeshua sent the disciples back to wait in that upper room, those 10 days they waited, they knew Shavuot was coming. I don't think they knew what all was coming with it. <laughs> but the gift of the Holy Spirit is a, I liken it into a, an engagement ring or a betrothal ring. It is a gift to the church to remind us <laughs> that our beloved loves us, he finds us beautiful, and we find him beautiful, my beloved. My beloved is the most beautiful among thousands and thousands. My beloved is the most beautiful among thousands and thousands. My Among thousands and thousands, my beloved is the most beautiful. Among thousands and thousands, Yeshua. Beloved is the most beautiful 
I talked about last night is how this is the month that um, <laughs> it's the month, it's the season that, that Esther petitioned the king. <laughs> Esther petitioned the king and was granted her request. Why? Because she was his beloved, right? And we are his beloved too. I'm going to do I speak to the mountain. <laughs> I just keep hearing it, so I'm going to do it. I speak to the mountain. I say move Do you know how big my God is? Do you know how great my God is? I say to the sick one Be healed Do you know how big my God is? Do you know how great my God is? Do that again I speak to the mountain And I say move Savior, healer is seated in the 
heavens, all things under his feet. There's no one greater, full of power. He reigns forever, King of all kings, the mighty warrior, Savior. like it's just filled back in where you dug out, right? But he says, guess what? Speak to that mountain. Continue to tell it to move. Continue to tell it to move in faith. I will grant you the petitions. I speak to the mountain and I say move. Do you know how big my God is? Do you know how great my God is? I say to the sick one, <laughs> Do you know how big my God is? Do you know how great my God is? He's a mighty warrior, he's savior, my healer, and he's seated in the heavens, all things under his feet. And there's no one greater, he is full of power, he reigns forever. dead ones who need to live. <laughs> there are those who are dead in their trespass and sin and they need to live. So I don't know who they are in your life, but speak to them today, right? I say to them, 
the dead one. Arise! <laughs> Do you know how big my God is? Do you know how great my God is? I command the darkness. Be gone! Do you know how big my God is? Do you know how great my God is? He's the mighty warrior, the savior. you are the king of all kings you are the king of all kings and you have taken Messiah Yeshua and you have seated him at your right hand and he holds all authority all authority and Lord you told us Jesus you told your disciples that I will give you authority and so God we have become weak in our authority we have become weak in our faith. We have become tired. We are facing a world that is full of attack and antagonism and difficulty and pain, and we see it all around us, and it's exhausting. But you, God, you never tire. You do not slumber. You do not sleep. You are awake. You are alive. You are strong, and the authority is still there. So, God, I ask, that you would show us where to walk in that authority. Give us the timing. Give us the words. I know that when Yeshua walked, the, Yeshua walked this earth, it was for three years, and Lord, he only did what he saw you do. He healed those who came to him. There were some that were not healed yet. There was time in the future there. Lord Jesus, let us learn to see with your eyes what God, you want done in your timing, in your place, where and how you want it done. Help us understand your ways more. Help us know your ways more. As we honor you today on this Shabbat. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us through commandments and has instructed us to hear the voice of the shofar.
Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with your commandments and has commanded us to be light unto the nations and has given us Yeshua, the Messiah, the light of the world. And Abba, Father, we thank you for you have done great and mighty things and you are doing great and mighty things. And in the midst of all that's happening around us, you are showing yourself strong in many ways. Sometimes it's just in the morning to recognize that the sun is still shining. It's beautiful outside. The plants are coming back. The flowers are starting to bloom. Those things which we thought were dead, you are bringing life to. And Father, I ask that that would be true within each one of our hearts as well. The places that we thought were closed and gone, that you want to resurrect, that you want to raise up, will be raised up. That we will rise up as a people of faith and honor and obedience for you. And Lord, I thank you for those that are here and I ask for those that are not able to be here. I thank you for Chris and Bob and I ask that today as they are with the Christian Motorcycle Association and they are doing participating in some of those things there that uh, this is a ministry for them and I thank you 
that you open that door and that that door is, is a good door for them. I ask that you would bless them on this day as they are there. I ask for Deborah as she is with family. I ask that you would bring her back to us quickly and safely, that you would strengthen her in her stand for you. Father, I ask for others. Oh, Lord, for William and Regina in Washington, I ask, Lord, that you would be their provider. You would open the way for their home to be fixed and be ready, that you would get the permits they need, that you would open doors that have been closed until now, doors only you can open. Father, I ask that you would do that for them. Thank you for their faithfulness. Thank you, Father, for their faithfulness. And Lord, there are so many others. The needs are great, but you are greater. Our hearts are heavy at times, but you have said that if we'll put them, give them to you, the burdens would be light, for your burdens are not heavy, and you strengthen us and support us and give us rest when we need it. So thank you for that. Thank you for our Messiah and for what he taught us, and he taught us to pray in this way. Say it with me if you know it. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power the glory forever. Amen.
worthy is the Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the Lamb of God who is our Messiah, who is the coming King, the rightful owner of the earth, <laughs> because that's who he is. We'll have to practice this song and make sure we've got the right words for it for next week. He had the wrong song. You didn't give him, gave him a title, but there's a point. Yeah. She gave me enough information. I just presumed we already had it. Oh. oh. Was that okay. a good song? Should we do it again? Later. Next week. Okay. I don't mean today. <laughs> I got to learn the melody. I've never sung melody on it before. So <laughs> I'm, I'm used to doing this harmony part, you know, and, and she's singing the melody on the chorus. I'm like, I, I, I don't think I know the melody. I'm trying to read the music in it anyway. Um, but the message of the song is clear, and it is a necessary message. The darling of heaven was crucified for us. The only begotten Son of God paid the penalty, paid the price for our inability to do something which was to obey him. He paid the price for all of it, and he offers it to us as a paid-for deal to come into his presence and say, Forgive me, Father. I stand with your son. I'm aligning myself with your son. I'm making him my king. And by making him our king, our Father God is pleased. We're going to be reading today the last two portions out of the book of Leviticus. Um, next week we begin the book of Numbers, and I have on the table in the back, on, on a golden, rod, a, a, I think it's goldenrod paper, um, the readings for Numbers already lined out, so that you can have not just the Torah portion and the Haftra portion as as the that we follow, but also the added apostolic writings. They're on that paper. It, they, it is posted on the Facebook page every Sunday morning, usually. Um, I haven't got them set up for numbers yet, but I will have that done tomorrow. It's also on our, on our web page where we have a calendar link. You can go to the calendar and go to the Saturday, and on that Saturday you will see the reading. In fact, I think it goes for the whole week. So if you go to the calendar on the web page, you should be able to find the reading. Um, I try to make it accessible, but sometimes it's hard to find because, you know, we're not all used to looking in the same places. But our reading today is the final portion out of the book of Leviticus. Behar Bechotai, on the mountain and in my statutes. That's two different portions, but the two portions are fairly short, so we're going to read them together. <laughs> Craig's going to do our first reading out of Leviticus chapter 25. He's going to read verses 1 through 38. The Lord then spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I shall give you, then the land shall have a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather it in its crops. But during the seventh year the land shall have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field nor prune your vineyard. Your harvests after growth you shall not reap, and your grapes of untrimmed vines you shall not gather. The land shall have a sabbatical year. All of you shall have the Sabbath products of the land for your food for yourself for food, yourself and your male and female slaves, and your hired man and your foreign resident, those who live as aliens with you. Even your cattle and the animals that are in your land shall have all its crops to eat. You are also to count off seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven years, so that you have the time of the seven Sabbath of years, namely forty-nine years. You shall then sound a ram's horn abroad on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement you shall sound a horn all through your land. You shall thus consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim a release through the land to all its inhabitants. 
it shall be a jubilee for you and each of you shall return to his own property and each of you shall return to his family you shall have the fiftieth year as a jubilee you shall not sow nor reap its aftergrowth nor gather in from its untrimmed vines for it is a jubilee it shall be holy to you you shall eat its crops out of the field on this year of jubilee each of you shall return to his own property if you make a sale moreover to your friend or buy from your friend's hand you shall not wrong one another corresponding to the number of years after the jubilee you shall buy from your friend he is to sell to you according to the number of years of crops in proportion to the extent of the years you shall increase its price and in proportion to the fewness of the years you shall diminish its price for it is a number of crops he is selling to you so you shall not wrong one another but you shall fear your god for i am the lord your god you shall thus observe my statutes and keep my judgments so as to carry them out that you may live securely on the land then the land will yield its produce so that you can eat your fill and live securely on it but if you say what are we going to eat on the seventh year if we do not sow or gather in our crops then i will so order my blessings for you in the sixth year that it will bring forth the crop for three years when you are sowing the eighth year you can still eat the old things from the crop eating the old until the ninth year when its crop comes in the land moreover shall not be sold permanently for the land is mine for you are but aliens and sojourners with me thus for every piece of your property you are to provide for the redemption of the land if a fellow countryman of yours becomes so poor he has to sell part of his property then his nearest kinsman is to come and buy back what his relative has sold or in case a man has no kinsman but so recovers his means as to find sufficient for its redemption then he shall calculate the years since its sale and refund the balance to the man to whom he sold it and so return to his property but if he has not found sufficient means to get it back for himself then what he has sold shall remain in the hands of its purchaser until the year, year of jubilee but at the jubilee it shall revert that he may return to his property likewise if a man sells a dwelling house in a walled city then his redemption right remains valid until a full year from its sale his right of redemption lasts a full year but if it is not brought not bought back for him within the space of a full year then the house that is in the walled city passes permanently to its purchaser throughout his generations it does not revert in the jubilee the houses of the villages however which have no surrounding wall shall be considered as open fields they have redemption rights and revert in the jubilee as for the cities of the levites the levites have a permanent right of redemption for the houses of the cities which are their possession what therefore belongs to the levites may be redeemed in a house sale in the city of this possession reverts in the jubilee for the houses of the cities of the levites are their possession among the sons of israel but pasture fields of their cities shall not be sold for that is their perpetual possession now in a case now in case a countryman of yours becomes poor and his means with regard to you falter then you are to sustain him like a stranger or, or a sojourner that he may live with you do not take usurious interest from him but revere your god that your countrymen may live with you you shall not give him your silver at interest nor your food for gain i am the lord your god who brought you out of the land of egypt to give you the land of canaan and to be your god Joy is going to come and read our next portion. We're skipping a little bit. We're going to go to chapter 26, and she's going to read verse 1 through 34. 
Moreover, thou shalt make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet with cherubim of cunning work shalt thou make them. The length of one curtain shall be eight and twenty cubits and the breadth of one curtain four cubits and every one of the curtains shall have one measure. The five curtains shall be coupled together one to another and the five curtains shall be coupled one to another. And thou shalt make loops of blue upon the edge of the one curtain, from the selvage in the coupling, and likewise shalt thou make in the uppermost edge of another curtain, in the coupling of the second. Fifty loops shalt thou make in the one curtain, and fifty loops shalt thou make in the edge of the curtain that is in the coupling of the second, that the loops may take hold of one Joy, another. Where are you reading from? Oh, um, Leviticus 26, 1 to 34. Uh, Exodus. <laughs> yeah, you might want to Oh, goodness going, sakes. That doesn't All the sound curtain. quite right. Curtain. Curtains. We need to yeah, fix what? the curtain. Maybe um. that's the message. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, goodness it's okay. sakes. <laughs> I caught it this time. There have been times that the reading's gone all the way through, and I'm like, <laughs> okay. where are they reading from? So anyway, but, but we need to be hearing this part here. Out of Leviticus 26. <laughs> who, who, ye shall make you no idols, nor graven image. Yes, that's it. Neither rear you up a standard image, neither shall ye set up any image of stone in your land to bow down in, unto it. For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time, and ye shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land safely. And I will give peace in the land, and ye shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land. Neither shall the sword go through your land. And ye shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. And five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. And your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. For I will have respect unto you, and make you fruitful, and multiply you, and establish my covenant with you. And ye shall eat old store, and bring forth the old because of the new. And I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you, and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, that ye should not be their bondsmen. And I have broken the bands of your yoke, and made you go upright. But if you will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning og that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. And ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you, and you shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. And if ye will not yet, for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins, and I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass." and your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. And if ye walk contrary unto me, and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle, and make you few and number, and your highways shall be desolate. And if ye will not re be reformed by me by these things, but will walk contrary unto me, 
Then will I also walk contrary unto you, and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. And I will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when you are gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you, and ye shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. And when I have broken the staff of your bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver you your bread again by weight. And ye shall eat and not be satisfied. And if ye will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins, and ye shall eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters shall ye eat. And I will destroy your high places, and cut down your images, and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. And I will make you, make your cities waste, and bring your sanctuaries unto desolation, and will not smell the savor of your sweet um, odors. And I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies will dw which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the heathen, and will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths, as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemies' land. Even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. As long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when ye dwelt upon it. And upon them that are left alive of you, I will send a faintness into their hearts in the lands of their enemies, and the sound of a shaken leaf shall chase them, and they shall flee as fleeing from a sword, and they shall fall when none pursueth. And they shall fall upon one another as if it were before a sword, when none pursueth, and ye have no power to stand before your enemies. And ye shall perish among the heathen, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. And they that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity in your enemies' lands, and also in the iniquities of their fathers. Shall they pine away with them? I'm not sure how far I'm supposed to read. <laughs> <laughs> About five verses ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> and my little thing fell out somewhere. So. <laughs> it's okay. You were reading well. I wasn't going to stop that. <laughs> Let's see. What verse did she stop on? Because she's. Yeah, much, much, much more applicable, huh? <clears throat> I'm going to start with verse 39. Those of you who may be left will rot away because of their iniquity in the lands of your enemies, and also because of the iniquities of their forefathers, they will rot away with them. Here's the good part. <laughs> if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers in their unfaithfulness, which they committed against me, and also in their acting with hostility against me, I also was acting with hostility against them to bring them into the land of their enemies. Or if in their uncircumcised heart becomes humbled so that they then make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob. I will remember also my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham as well. And I will remember the land. For the land will be abandoned by them and will make up its Sabbaths while it is made desolate without them. They, meanwhile, will be making amends for their iniquity because they rejected my ordinance and their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet in spite of this, when they are in the land of the enemy, I will not reject them, nor will I abhor them so as to destroy them, breaking my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will remember for them the covenant with their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. These are the statutes and ordinances and laws which the Lord himself established between himself and the sons of Israel through Moses at Mount Sinai. 
Sherry, you're going to read the rest of this portion for us. Thank you. Chapter 27. Again the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When a man makes a difficult vow, he shall be valued according to your valuation of persons belonging to the Lord. If your valuation is of the male from twenty years even to sixty years old, then your valuation shall be fifty shekels of silver after the shekel of the sanctuary. Or, if it is a female, then your valuation shall be thirty shekels. If it be from five years even to twenty years old, then your valuation for the male shall be twenty shekels, and for the female ten shekels. But if they are from a month even up to five years old, then your valuation shall be five shekels of silver for the male, and for the female your valuation shall be three shekels of silver. If they are from sixty years old and upward, if it is a male, then your valuation shall be fifteen shekels, and for the female ten shekels. But if he is poorer than your valuation, then he shall be placed before the priest, and the priest shall value him. According to the means of the one who vowed, the priest shall value him. Now if it is an animal of the kind which men can present as an offering to the Lord, any such that one gives to the Lord shall be holy. He shall not replace it or exchange it, a good for a bad, or a bad for a good. Or if he does exchange animal for animal, then both it and its substitute shall become holy. If, however, it is any unclean animal of the kind, which men do not present as an offering to the Lord, then he shall place the animal before the priest. The priest shall value it as either good or bad. As you, the priest, value it, so it shall be. But if he should ever wish to redeem it, then he shall add one-fifth of it to your valuation. Now if a man consecrates his house as holy to the Lord, then the priest shall value it as either good or bad. As the priest values it, so it shall stand. Yet if the one who consecrates it should wish to redeem his house, then he shall add one-fifth to your valuation price to it, so that it may be his. Again, if a man consecrates to the Lord part of the fields of his own property, then your valuation shall be proportionate to the seed needed for it a homer of barley seed of fifty shekels of silver. If he consecrates his field as the year of the jubilee, according to your valuation, it shall stand. If he consecrates his field after the jubilee, however, then the priest shall calculate the price for him proportionate to the years that are left until the year of jubilee, and it shall be deducted from your valuation. If the one who consecrates it should ever wish to redeem the field, then he shall add one-fifth of your valuation price to it, so that it may pass to him. Yet if he will not redeem the field, but has sold the field to another man, it may no longer be redeemed. And when it reverts in a jubilee, the field shall be holy to the Lord, like a field set apart. It shall be for the priest as his property. Or if he consecrates to the Lord a field which he has bought, which is not part of the field of his own property, then the priest shall calculate for him the amount of your valuation up to the year of Jubilee, and then he shall on that day give your valuation as holy to the Lord. In the year of Jubilee the field shall return to the one whom, from whom he bought it, to whom the possession of the land belongs. Every valuation of yours, moreover, shall be after the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel shall be twenty garas. However, a firstborn among animals, which as a firstborn belongs to the Lord, no man may consecrate it, whether ox or sheep, it is the Lord's. But if it is among the unclean animals, then he shall redeem it according to your valuation, and add it to one-fifth of it. And it is, and if it is not redeemed, then it shall be sold according to your valuation. Nevertheless, anything which a man sets apart to the Lord out of all that he has, of man or animal, or of the field, or his own property, shall not be sold or redeemed. However, anything devoted to destruction is most holy to the Lord. No one who may have been set apart among men shall be ransomed. He shall surely be put to death. Thus, all the tithe of the land of the seeds of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. 
If therefore a man wishes to redeem part of his tithe, he shall add to it one fifth of it. For every tenth part of herd or flock, whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. He is not to be concerned whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it, or if he does exchange it, then both it and its substitute shall become holy. It shall not be redeemed. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the sons of Israel at Mount Sinai. Hazak, hazak, venit hazak. Be strong, be strong, and let us be strengthened as we complete the book of Leviticus. Sherry's going to read out of Jeremiah also, Jeremiah sixteen nineteen through seventeen eighteen. This is the portion from the Haftarah, the prophets, that is paired with our Torah portion. O oh Lord, my strength and my stronghold, and my refuge in the day of distress, to you the nations will come from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers have inherited nothing but falsehood, futility and things of no profit. Can man make gods for himself? Yet they are not gods. Therefore, behold, I am going to make them know. This time I will make them know my power and my might, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. The sin of Judah is written down with an iron stylus. With a diamond point it is engraved upon the tablet of their heart and on the horns of their altars. As they remember their children, so they remember their altars and their ashram. By green trees on the high hills, O mountain of mine in the countryside, I will give over your wealth and all your treasures for booty, your high places for sin throughout your borders, and you will even of yourself let go of your inheritance that I gave you. And I will make you serve your enemies in the land which you do not know, for you have kindled a fire in my anger which will burn forever. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord, for he will be like a bush in the desert and will not see when prosperity comes, but will live in stony waste in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitant. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord in whose trust is the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green and it will not be anxious in a year of drought nor cease to yield fruit. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to give to each man according to his ways according to the results of his deeds. As a partridge that hatches eggs which it has not laid, so is he who makes a fortune, but unjustly. In the midst of his days it will forsake him, and in the end he will be a fool. A glorious throne on, hi on high from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away on earth will be written down, because they have forsaken the fountain of living water, even the Lord. Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved, for you are my praise. Look, they keep saying to me, Where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. But as for me, I am not hurried away from being a shepherd after you, nor have I longed for the woeful days. You yourself know that the utterance of my lips was in your presence. Do not be a terror to me. You are my refuge in the day of disaster. Let those who persecute me be put to shame, but as for me, let me not be put to shame. Let them be dismayed, but let me not be dismayed. Bring on them a day of disaster and crush them with twofold destruction. Our apostolic writings, Frank is going to come and read for us out of, we're starting with Luke. And do Luke 4 and then Matthew 16. Luke 4, 14 through 22. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. 
and as he, his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood to read. And the book of the prophet of Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the release of the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. He has set those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all of the synagogue were fixed upon him, and he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And they were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, "This is this not Joseph's son? Is that it? Is that it? Okay. And Matthew chapter oh, 16. I missed Matthew. I got Go it. Go ahead with that one too. Okay. Matthew 16 verse 20 through 28. He warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not sitting your mind on God's, setting your mind on God's interest but man's then Jesus said to his disciples if anyone wishes to come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it but whosoever loses his life for my sake will find it for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and for, for forfeits his soul or what will a man give in exchange for a soul for the son of man is going to come in glory in the glory of his Father with his angels, and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his glory. Thank you. There's places where I look at this and go, why is that paired with that, and why is that paired with that? And I ask those questions, and I'm sure you do too. Sometimes they almost don't seem to get along. I think part of the pairing today that we see in Luke and Matthew, in Luke we have Yeshua standing in the synagogue. As was his custom, he went to Sabbath, went to synagogue on Sabbath. And as was common, someone who's a visiting teacher would be invited to read from the scroll and to share. And they handed him the book of Isaiah. And he said, The spirit of Adonai is upon me because he has anointed me to announce good news to the poor, send me to proclaim freedom for the imprisoned, renewed sight for the blind, release those who have been crushed, to proclaim a year of the favor of Adonai. He's saying God has sent me to declare a Yovel year, a 50th year, a year where everything gets restored. That was what Mashiach was to do. It's interesting because when he did all that, they loved it. It says, after closing the scroll and returning to the Shamash, he sat down, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he started speaking to them, Today you've heard it. This passage in the Tanakh is fulfilled. Everyone was speaking well of him and marveling. Such appealing words were coming from his mouth. Could this be Joseph's son? Really? We know this kid. We know his family. Wait a minute. This doesn't fit. Huh? It's just Joseph's son. But they were marveling, and it was good. 
We didn't read the next part. I'm going to read it now. Then Yeshua said to them, No doubt you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. We've heard about all the things that have been going on over in the Galilee. Now do them here in your hometown. Yes, he said, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. It's true, I'm telling you. When Elijah was in Israel and the sky was sealed off for three and a half years so that all the land suffered a severe famine, there were many widows. But Eliyahu was sent to none of them. Only to a widow in Zarephath in the land of Sidon. And there were many people with Tazerat, with leprosy in Israel during the time of the prophet Elisha. But not one of them was healed. Only Naaman, the Syrian. And on hearing this, everyone in the synagogue was filled with fury. They loved, I'm here to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I'm here to give you a jubilee. And then he says, now don't demand things of me. Don't demand. Because he knew, as Mashiach, that there was a time for that declaration in Israel as a nation. And he knew that there was a season for the Gentiles. But the people in the synagogue didn't want to hear about that. They didn't want to hear that, yeah, there were a lot of widows in Israel. God didn't honor them with Elisha, with Elijah. The one that was honored was the one who helped him, who gave him a room, who took care of him, who fed him when he asked. We mentioned last night that those who give to a prophet receive a prophet's reward. Those who support the teachers receive the reward of the teachers. That's part of the tribe of Zebulun. They were the merchants. They went out. They, they, they were the ones who, who went to other nations. They were the ones who got on the ships and went and came and went and came. And, and they carried the message of this wonderful Yahweh God that, he, that they served. And they brought things back to Israel, like the shells that were used to dye the tzitzit. The blue of the tabernacle was a specific type. There were many things. In fact, Craig's asked me a few times, where did they get that in the wilderness? You know, the description of how to build the tabernacle. Where did they get that in the wilderness? Where, did they get, where would they get that from? Well, traders, those who came. Those who came to them and those that they went out to and traded with. And they brought back many things. And many of those things are things God said, use this in my temple. Use this in my tabernacle. Use this in my tabernacle. Not everything there was native to Israel. God has always been about bringing others in. He has always been that. It was never supposed to be us four and no more. You've heard that phrase, right? Us four and no more, just us. We're the ones that are going to be saved. No, it was never about that. It was about God reaching out to all mankind. I'm going to ask you a kind of a, well, I'll show you. Here, these guys in Nazareth, first they loved him, and then they heard something they didn't like, and they turned on him really quickly, and it says they tried to um, throw him down a cliff. <laughs> they were going to kill him. That's how angry they got with him. In our reading in Matthew, we have... He's been telling the disciples, trying to explain to them what's going to happen, trying to let them know, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. They're not going to like it. I'm going to be crucified. But don't worry, I'll be back after three days. It says he told them that. They still didn't get it. They didn't get it. They didn't understand. And Peter, one of my favorites, because he always spoke what he thought, Began to rebuke him, say, no, 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 you're the Messiah. You're supposed to set up your kingdom. He went from honoring him to arguing with him. And Yeshua had to tell him, no, get back. No, don't, don't, 
don't say those things. That's not true. You need to be after God's heart. After God's heart. What was God's heart? God's heart was the salvation of the world. Not just setting up the kingdom for Israel. God's heart was after salvation for all. Yes, he will be setting up a kingdom. Yes, he will be redeeming his people, Israel. No, God has not forgotten his people. He has not forgotten the covenant he has with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he will never forget that covenant. He's promised that over and over and over again. He has told them, this land, this area, we've got a map on the wall over there, Israel, this land. Who owns the land? God says it's his. God said it was his. Dare I say the whole earth actually is God's? The whole earth is God's. When God created man, he put him in a garden. Whose garden was it? Was it Adam and Eve's garden or was it God's garden? It was God's. And God said, take care of the garden. Take care of it. And if you'll do it the way I tell you to, and you'll follow after me, and you'll stay with me, then this is going to be wonderful. It's beautiful. And it's going to produce and produce and produce and produce and produce and produce and produce. And all that you need will be produced if you will do it my way. But no man wanted knowledge, wanted the knowledge. And so they ate of the tree of good and the knowledge of good and evil. They wanted the knowledge. They wanted the power. They wanted that. And it kind of threw everything for a loop, didn't it? But even with all of that, who owns the land? God still does. God owns the land, especially the land of Israel, because he said it. This land is mine. You can't own it. He told the people, you are not going to own this land. In a sense, what he said is, you can lease it from me. You can live on my land. You can work my land. You do it my way, and my land will produce for you. And it will produce for you, and it will produce more than enough. In fact, it will produce enough that you don't even have to harvest to the corners of your field. You can leave the corners alone because let, let people who don't own, who aren't leasing the land, who, who don't have a right to that property right there, let them come and take from that. Leave a space. Leave room. There will be more than enough if you do it my way. If you do it my way. The whole concept of having a sabbatical year is for the land to replenish itself. The sabbatical year was so the land could replenish itself. Organic farmers know you have to replenish the land naturally. You can't just, we can't just keep throwing chemicals at, at the land and make it work right. It, in the long run, that's not good for it. In fact, God knows and God tried to instruct these people and he set it up so that Every seventh year, they didn't do anything on the land. They let it lay fallow. They let the animals walk through it. The cattle, the sheep. That would take care of the underbrush. That would take care of some of the, the thistles and thorns that might be growing up, because those creatures like them. That would take care There's all kinds of, of ecological benefit to doing the fallow land the way God has said to do it. The land will produce and will produce and will produce. But if you are going to take everything you can out of his land and you are going to decimate it by just con continually working it and overworking it and overworking it and overworking it, we will end up depleting the land of its qualities that it's needed there to grow the crop. Farmers know this. That's why we now ro they rotate crops a lot of times now because different crops use different parts out of the soil. If you use the same crop over and over and over again in this portion, it's going to pull up all of the nutrients for that crop. And then after a while, if you don't replenish it, that crop's not going to grow so well on that land. God knew that. God set it all up. He organized it. He said, this is my land. Do it my way. <laughs> I'm the king. 
I own it. You get to do it my way. You get to feel like you own it. You get to benefit from it. You get to enjoy it. You get to have all of the produce from it. But you got to do it my way. I heard someone once say that God is not an if-then God. I went, really? Have you read the Old Testament at all? <laughs> because our God is an if-then God, just like most good parents are if-then parents. Honestly, if you think about it, when you're teaching the kids proper food and nutrition, if you eat your vegetables, then you can have dessert. Right? If, then. If you do this, then you reap this reward. If you do this, then you reap this reward. It's an excellent parenting style. We get it from God. <laughs> he set it up. If you will do it my way, then I will bless you. And even in the year where you let it lay fallow, and all you do is just take enough to eat that meal, and you let other people take enough to eat that meal, and you're not collecting it, and you're not putting it in the barns, you're letting it lay fallow, you just, just get enough, and, you, and you're eating from the store from the year prior, right? And yet you have a Yovel year coming every 50 years because you'd have the Sabbath year where you let it lay fallow. Then you have the Yovel year where you're still letting it lay fallow. That's two years in a row. You're not harvesting. Two years in a row, you're not planting. Two years in a row, you're not working. What's there in the third year to eat? All the stuff that you saved up from the sixth year. You see, and that's something God said. If you will look at me and go, God, I'm going to do this. I don't know how you're going to provide for the next three years, but I'll do what you said. Then I will cause the land to give you enough to put it aside to have it. So no one has to go hungry. I, I knew a couple that had read some things in Scripture and and they literally got to the point that they decided that they weren't supposed to have any savings at all. God didn't want them to store up treasures on earth, so we're only to store up treasures in heaven. And so every month, if they had any money left over from their paychecks, rather than put it in a savings account or put it in a safe place to keep for future needs or whatever, yes, they budgeted for some things. They, they put aside for repair of their vehicle. They put, but anything that was extra, they would donate and give away so they wouldn't be building any savings because we're not supposed to have a savings account. And I went... So you don't get to have a Sabbath year. What? Well, every seven years, God says to let the land lay fallow and eat off of the food that you stored up from the years prior. So you're supposed to store up food for the year that you let it lay fallow. There's reasons for being wise in the way we handle our finances. There's nothing wrong with having a good savings account. Why? Because God says we can do that. For the year that he has us lay off. I know people that in this last year had enough in their savings that when they were laid off, they've done just fine. The very few and far between, most of us didn't do that. Most of us haven't done that. Most of us don't have that kind of income in our savings accounts. Most of us literally, unfortunately, live month to month I have enough to pay my bills this month and I thank you Lord that I have enough to pay my bills this month and when I have extra well that that's usually there comes an extra need right and and we have learned when God gives us something extra put it aside because there's going to be a need it hasn't failed yet when God gives us an extra amount and we put it aside Something will happen, like the car will break down. Well, there's the money we need. Hey, it's already there. You guys keep giving it away to other people. <laughs> we do. Yes. yes. Joy just said that people on the Internet won't be able to hear that, that we give it away to other people. Yes, we do. When God tells us to. When God tells us to, we will give it away. But there's also this place where God says set it aside. And there is money, and we do do that. When God gives us extra he tells us what to do with it. Okay? God says, if you're going to be doing a sabbatical year, ask me. He said, ask me. He didn't say, just assume I'm going to do it. He said, if you ask me, how am I going to eat? <laughs> 
If you ask me in this sabbatical year, I will provide more than enough. I will provide more than enough. If we ask him, James says you have not because you ask not. And sometimes when we ask, we ask it to benefit ourselves and for our own pleasures, not necessarily for what God wants for us. But if we will ask him, if we'll say, Lord, I know that you're leading me to do this, so what are you going to do to help that happen? How do you, what, what? When we first started this ministry, it's been 10 years, 11 years, I don't know. It was in my memories the other day. I did the first six month letter sent out to people where we'd been in a, a, in a facility for six months and I said, okay guys, we wanna make a contract now with the landowner and say we'd like to lease it for a full year but to do that we need commitments from people so we can make sure we can pay the rent. You know, When you make a commitment, you wanna make sure you can take care of it, right? And God said, do that. And, and we had people who've never even come in the door of this building or that building who for one year, every month, sent us a tithe to meet the budget in the other facility. People who've never come to a single service, but because they believed that God called me, because they believed that God told me to do this, they put their money where their mouths were, and they stepped up, and they gave. And you know what each one of them has been rewarded. Each one of them has been rewarded in their own ministries and in their own places. When you ask God, when God says do this, and you say, okay, God, how are you going to provide? He often will tell us something. You know, like I said earlier, if there's a mountain you need moved, sometimes you wake up and there's a shovel next to you and God says, pick it up. But sometimes you wake up and someone else is already there with a backhoe moving it. I've heard of stories like that. However God wants to meet the need, God will meet the need. But if God is telling us to do something, he will provide for it. He will provide for it. He always does. He always has. If we do what he has told us to do. Right? If we don't do what he's told us to do, well... If you don't eat your vegetables, you don't get dessert, right? That was a rule at our house. If you don't eat your vegetables, you don't get dessert. Now, I never made them eat all of them because sometimes we just didn't like them. And I understand that. But you've got to eat at least three peas or maybe five. <laughs> you've got to try it. You've got to take three bites at least. If we don't, what happens to the person that does not eat a halfway healthy diet? And I say halfway because nowadays it's really hard to eat a really healthy diet, but it can be done. What happens to people who don't keep healthy diets? We get sick, right? We see it all over the place. What happens to people who don't exercise at all? We get sick. We see it all over the place. What happens when you don't honor God with your finances? You get holes in your pockets. <laughs> and you put money in and it flies out. <laughs> That's what God said. If we do it his way, he will honor us. And no, this is not a plea for money for this ministry. Let me tell you something. We are so blessed. God has said to do this ministry and he has been providing over and above so that we can give away. We can bless others. Why? Because God said to. There is to be no poor among you. That's what he says. If your brother is in need, you help your brother. If someone is hungry next to you, you have a farm, you have a field, you have all these crops, let them come and harvest. Give them something to do. That gives them pride, too. 
Take care of each other. Have any of you ever wondered, in the book of Daniel, it says that Daniel studied the word, studied Torah, he studied the books of Moses, he studied the law, he looked into it, and it says he saw the time was coming for the return to the land. Now Daniel never got to return to Jerusalem. He stayed in Babylon. He never got to return. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, those wonderful men who stood up in the fiery furnace, they did not get to return to Jerusalem. But Daniel saw that the time was coming. How did Daniel see it? Because he read this. And it says, the land will be paid its Sabbaths. The time that you are in the land of your enemies, the land will rest and it will be repaid. And he calculated how many Sabbaths did we not do? How many years of Sabbath years were supposed to be done that Israel had not done? He did the math. Yes, we can use algebra later <laughs> in life. He did the math. He figured it out. For every year, they had not had a sabbatical. God said, that's how many years you will be in captivity. He did the math. Seventy sabbaticals had not been honored. And he said, okay, so now what? It's time, time is coming. We're, if I've done this math right, and, and there was a, if I've done this math right, then we're supposed to be returning to the land soon, so what does that depend on? It says in verse 41 of Leviticus 26, at that time that I will be going against them, bringing them into the land of their enemies. But if their uncircumcised hearts will grow humble, and they are paid the punishment for their misdeeds, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, my covenant with Yitzhak, my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember the land. For the land will lie abandoned without them. It will be paid its Shabbats, while it lays, lays, lies desolate without them, and they will be paid the punishment. The land will get its Shabbat. Then it says, in spite of this, I will not reject them while they're in the land of their enemies, nor will I loathe them or utterly destroy them. I will remember them. If we will let our hearts be circumcised, if we will grow humble, verse, 30, verse Verse 40 says, Confess their misdeeds and those of their ancestors which they committed against me in their rebellion. And they admit that they went against me at that time. So there's this place that Daniel said, Okay, 70 Sabbaths, 70 Sabbath years. It's almost 70 years are up. What do we need to do? We need to humble ourselves before God. We need to humble ourselves before God, and we need to confess the sins of ourselves and of our fathers. There is nowhere in Scripture that we see anything that Daniel himself ever did that was wrong. He is held up as an example of a man who honored God from day one and never quit. And yet, in the book of Daniel, he prays, and he says, God... Forgive me for the sins of my fathers. Forgive me. He confessed the sins as if they were his own. He prayed, and God heard. And they were returned to the land. Not all of them, but those who were willing were returned to the land because God heard the humility of Daniel and others of his generation. In Jeremiah, we read that there's a curse on the person who trusts in the human, who mere, merely relies on human strength, whose heart is turned away from Adonai. When we don't trust God, we walk in the curses of this land but and here's the best but in the world 
Blessed is the man who trusts in Adonai. Adonai will be his security. He will be like a tree planted near water. It spreads out its roots by the river. He won't even notice when the heat comes. <laughs> Foliage will be luxuriant. Not anxious in a year of drought, but will keep yielding fruit. If then, if we follow after God, then we will see the rewards. Does that mean we all get a brand new car next week? No. <laughs> That's not what it's talking about. It's not a name it and claim it gospel. But it is saying if we will follow him, he will take care of us. He will meet our needs. And he will give us enough to help others get their needs met. He will take care of it. He will help us. He will explain to us things that are going to happen and that are going on. And he will give us strength for them. When Yeshua began telling the disciples that he was going to be crucified, that there would be suffering, he also gave them the strength and the ability to handle it. He gave that to them. They just had to hold on to it. We are not going to go through anything that God is not going to go through with us. Okay. Does that mean we're always going to have wonderful joy and wonderful peace and everything is always going to be wonderful and beautiful and happy and no if you read in the book of Hebrews one of my favorite passages chapter 11 it's called the hall of faith that's what we used to call it when I was in Bible college the hall of faith because in Hebrews 11 it talks about those men of great faith, those women of great faith. And it's almost like you're walking down the hall, and here's the portrait of this one. And here's the portrait of this one. The hall of faith. These are people that are raised up as examples for us. By trusting. I'm going to go, I'm going to start with Noah in verse 7. By trusting Noah, received divine warning about things that are yet unseen. I believe God is warning his people about things that are yet unseen right now, even now. God is waking people up in the middle of the night and telling them what to do. He's doing it. Are we willing to listen? God warned Noah. He got divine direction about what had not yet happened. And it saved his household because he did what God said to do. Through trusting, he put the world under condemnation and he received the righteousness that comes from trusting. By trusting, Abraham obeyed after being called to go out to a place that God would give him as a possession. Indeed, he went out not knowing where he was going. But by trusting, he lived as a temporary resident. By trusting, by trusting, he fathered a son in his old age. When Sarah was barren and past the age of being able to have children. By trusting, all these things happened. By trusting, Yaakov, when he was dying, blessed each one of Joseph's sons. Leaning on his walking stick, he bowed in prayer. He blessed them all by trusting. He walked in the office of a prophet, and he told them what was coming. By trusting, Joseph, near the end of his life, told them, Take my body with you. Take my body with you to the promised land. Don't leave me here in Egypt. He knew he was dying. He knew they were going to embalm him. He said, don't leave me here. When you leave, take me with you. By trusting, the walls of Jericho came down. By trusting, Rahab, the prostitute, welcomed spies and did not die with the rest who were disobedient in Jericho. What more do I say? There's not enough time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, David, Shmuel and the prophets who through trusting conquered kingdoms, worked righteousness, received what was promised, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, had their weakness turned to strength, grew mighty in battle, routed foreign armies. We love that part. 
Women received back their dead, resurrected. Other people were stretched on the rack and beaten to death and refused to be ransomed so they could gain a better resurrection. Others underwent the trials of being mocked and whipped and chained and imprisoned. They were stoned, sought in two, murdered by the sword. They went about clothed in sheepskin and goatskin and destitute and persecuted and mistreated and wandering about in deserts and mountains and living in caves and holes in the ground. The world was not worthy of them. And all of these were attested to because of their trusting. They did not necessarily receive what was promised in their life. But God has planned something better. God has planned something that involves us. It's not always going to be beautiful. But I will tell you, if we will commit our ways to him and continue to commit our ways to him, he will prepare us for anything. He will be with us and he will tell us when to speak and the mountain will move. And he will tell us when to stand and speak truth and receive whatever comes at us. And he will strengthen us. I don't know if any of you have ever read the book, Fox's Book of Martyrs. I actually um, had to read that in Bible college. I've never had so many nightmares in my life. <laughs> I don't know how many of you have ever read the book, Night, by Elie Wiesel. Stories of a child, bar mitzvah, supposed to be bar mitzvah, ended up in the concentration camp. You met him. Oh, what an honor. We read these stories, and sometimes we don't get it. We don't understand. We ask questions, and we look at it. But I will challenge us all that when we ask these questions, we ask from within faith, within faith, within trust. I've given up asking God why, because he told me, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I know that sounds funny, but that's exactly what he told me. When I was mad at him at one point in my life, and I was yelling at him, and, and literally I was. I was in my room, and I was by myself, and nobody was home, and I was like, God, why is this happening to me? Why would you let this happen? Why this? Why this? Why this? Why this? And I took a breath, and I heard in a very distinct voice, out loud, why not? <laughs> I was asking, why me? And he said, why not you? That was all he said. I actually went to the window to see who was speaking in the window because it was like, I'd never heard God's voice loud. loud. <laughs> but in that why not you, I heard this whole huge relief and information. And why not you? You think you're so special? Yes, I love you, and yes, you're special to me, but you really think that you shouldn't have to suffer the normal sufferings of this world? You really think that... And I was challenged to read the book of Job. If you ever want to know why, read Job. And tell me when God ever answers him that question, because he doesn't. You know what he says? He says, I'm God. You're not. Trust me. Walk with me. Janie comes up with the verse of the month, right? Usually it's a verse. It's something we can hold on to that will help us through the, the blessing that is found in the month, in the month of Sivan, what is found in the month of Sivan. And she sent me this. She goes, I don't know what's coming up, but it's Psalm 91. All of it. <laughs> the whole song. We'll sing that next week. We'll sing it next week. We should, yes, I think so. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him I will trust. 
Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. <laughs> it's all around us, isn't it? It's all around us still. He gave us this last fall. And I believe by bringing it back to us now, he's saying, remember, I told you. Remember, I told you, but remember this also. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. That's a promise he made. The enemy cannot take us out without his permission. You got to know that. We got to know that. With your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. He will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. There was a time in Yeshua's life when the enemy, Hasatan, took him to the top of the temple, the pinnacle of the temple, and said, Oh, Psalm says that there are going to be angels to protect you, so jump. Let the angels catch you. Jump. What did Jesus say to that? His response was, don't tempt the Lord your God. No, I'm not putting him to the test. No, I'm not going to be foolish and jump <laughs> where I'm not supposed to jump. God has put his angels in charge over us. He has. But I still ask you all to wear your seatbelts, <laughs> please. Use what God has given us. I remember one time driving home from a conference. I'd been at a training for my day job at the time. I'd been at a special training in, in, in the Corvallis area. And I was driving home, and we had a meeting that night that I needed to get to. And I'm driving down 97, OK? And I'm coming down 97, and, and I have a tendency to have a lead foot, I, I'll be honest. Um, I'm driving, and I see a buzzard. <laughs> For some reason, I saw these weird things. I, saw, I drove past a graveyard that I'd never seen in my life before. I didn't realize it was there, and there was a buzzard sitting there. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> I drove, I drove some more. I drove farther. I saw something else that was, a bit, you know, those big giant crows, the raven type things that saw three of them sitting on the top of a tree. And I went, why am I seeing this? And I'm driving and I'm headed home and I'm in a hurry because I'm going to be late for this meeting. I wanted to get home in time to shower and change and be at this meeting that I was supposed to be at to do music, to help with the music. And coming at me <laughs> was one of those ugly desert buzzards. Literally flew towards the car. I'm driving down the road. I see it coming at the windshield. I ducked it, went up and over the top, and, and, and I went, God, man, I need your angels. I need your protection. I need an angel in front of me, an angel behind me, an angel on my side. I'm seeing all these signs and messengers of death. God, I need your protection. And all of a sudden, my eyes were open to see on the hood of my Subaru. I saw this face turn and look at me. Don't make your guardian angel mad. <laughs> this face, I, I saw the form of it, and, and the eyes were just, oh. You know that look you get from your mother when you're in trouble? Well, that's what I saw. Like, you are going to get it. Stop. And I looked down, and I'm coming down 97, right? I'm doing 85. I'm 97. I slowed down. <laughs> because what I saw in that was, don't make my job so hard. <laughs> I'm here, I'm protecting you, but don't make my job hard. Do your part, too. 
He will give his angels charge over us. He does that. Those of you who know Chris need to ask her about the angels. A vision that she had. His angels will protect us. In their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot. In other words, we'll crush Satan under our feet. We can crush him under our feet. God's given us authority when we walk in him. Because he has set my love, because he has set his love upon me, this is God speaking, because you set your love on me, I will deliver him. So what's the if then? If we set our love on him, he will deliver us because he's known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. If then, call upon him, ask him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. There's these cards on the back tables for you. Everybody can pick one up and take it with you. Take it with you. Read it every day. Read it every day. Set our hearts on him. Set our hearts to following him. Set our hearts to hearing him. Set our hearts to doing what he has told us to do. He may give you different directions than he gave me. He has spoken to Joy very profoundly and strongly about evangelizing and getting the gospel out there and getting people saved. Absolutely essential. Time is short. He has told me, teach my word, teach my word, teach my word, teach my word. Time is short. What has God told you to do? Where is your work? Are you doing it? If you want his protection, which we do, then we have to take refuge in him. In him. Not our strength. Not our good deeds. Not our, not our work. But in him. And who he is. We take refuge in him. And when we do, we will be honored. He will remember his covenant. And we will be rewarded. Abba Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that when we turn to you, <laughs> you turn to us. That it doesn't matter how far we've wandered from you. It doesn't matter how much we turned our back on you. It doesn't. When we've disobeyed, we've disobeyed. But when we turn around and set our hearts on you and we say, Lord God, forgive. Circumcise my heart and put me in your path. You hear that. And you will not abandon us. You will bring us back. You will protect us. You will guard us. You will be our shelter. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I put my trust in you. I declare that I trust you. You are my God. And I will serve you with everything I have. And I thank you in the name of Yeshua. Joy.
his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you Lord, please. 